Hey, we're happy to welcome uh, Mr. Osborne back to the show. If if he keeps uh, uh, translating and publishing books, we'll keep having him on, folks. Uh, we're really happy to have him back because uh, we were just talking about on air, off air, sorry, about uh, uh, his new translation of what we have been, we are, and we will become. Because it's a book I've been hearing about for years. Uh, I, I I don't uh, speak or read French, so I, I couldn't go back to the original. There was a really bad machine-translated version floating around that was just about unreadable. So again, Michael Osborne has done a, a great service to uh, the international community of everybody interested in this stuff and everybody who should be interested in this stuff. Michael, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? Very good. Very good. So I, I mentioned before that the name of the book is What We Have Been, We Are, and We Will Become by the Abbe uh, Fournier. Uh, it, it's a book that is, uh, I guess you could say, is in the Martinist tradition, the Martinez tradition. Uh, perhaps we can talk about it. It'll probably come up that maybe it belongs within the wider mystical Christian corpus. But uh, I guess we really got to start at the beginning, uh, which was, which is who was Abbe Fournier? Okay. Um... Pierre Fournier uh, was born in 1738 in Bordeaux. Now, he's, um, the only remarks we have about his early life are from him himself, and that's the part of the semi-autobiographical nature of the book anyway. And in his words, he says, if I can quote, um, my formative years were passed in a quiet and obscure way according to the world so i suppose we could describe him as a typical teenager perhaps growing up who knows you know but anyway obscure so hard hard to find out a great deal about about him as an individual in his early years um we know from his autobiographical comments that um, he had at least two sisters uh that his family weren't wealthy but they were um relatively comfortable and his uncle was the grand um Augustinian, uh, sorry, the Grand Prior, I beg your pardon, of the Augustinians in, in Paris. And that was the order that Martinez de Pasquale would occasionally stay with. So that would have been the um, uh, the Grand Prior Rosier, uh, who who was known to have been an Elu Cohen, actually. Um, so um, as I say in my introduction, um, Fournier would have been known to Pasquale, if not the other way round, before they actually met. So you get the impression he's headhunted by by, by Pasquale um, when they chance meet, chance meet in the street in um, 1768. And Pasquale stops him and he says, I want you to join the Elo Cohen. Mm. Now, Fournier um, is ordained. He also later joins the um, um, nascent masonic movement in france which is contrary of course to um, papal law so it gives us an idea perhaps of him or 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 possibly even the attitude of the french church actually in bordeaux which had a tradition or the city had a tradition of being very laissez-faire and and accommodating towards um, new ideas so um, it was the centre of Illuminism, for instance, in the 18th century in France. And um, there were an, a, a couple of universities there and so on and so forth. Protestants were allowed to uh, worship uh, the, as long as they didn't walk around with their regalia on, you know, as in dog collars and things. They were allowed to, 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 to live and worship there, as were, as were Jews. Yeah. So they weren't persecuted um, as they were quite often in, for instance, Eastern Europe. So F- Bordeaux in particular was quite sort of open-minded. So we don't know if um, Fournier's membership of the Masonic orders him or, or or just the sort of general acceptance of um, spiritual inquiry, perhaps in that area. Um, he became Pasquale's secretary for at least a year between 1770 and 1771, replacing um, another Catholic um, priest, actually, who had come over with Pasquale with his regiment from Saint-Domingue. This is following the the Seven Years' War, I believe it was, when there was peace between England and France for a while. And uh, um, Fournier then um, becomes uh, Pasquale's secretary, and Pasquale writes, actually, I've done this because... He is very intelligent. He's very sensitive and understanding. There's a good knowledge of theology. 
So this was something that, that Pasquale was interested in and wanted um, with regards to the, the nascent development um, of, of this very early order um, of, the, of Elo Cohen as they're beginning to form and develop. It's a process, of course, as you know, that he didn't complete by the time of his death. Um, now, um, after the revolution, um, Fournier, unfortunately, he's a tonsured priest, by the way, which means he has the top of his head shaved. And I believe that he um, remained a tonsured priest for the rest of his life. He's referred to as such on his funerary monument in St Pancras New Church. This is an entablature fixed against the wall, and he's referred to as a tonsured priest. So we can only assume, and also by his writings, actually, that he remained very um, loyal to his um, to his ordination calling. And um, as such, he would have been on the payroll of the state as a tonsured priest in uh, pre-revolutionary France. It was an established church in the sense that the the, the, the crown or the state um, often gave people stipends and pensions and the like. Um, so when the revolution came and Bordeaux was um, the centre of one group, the Girondin, uh, who were a sort of not the most extreme revolutionary group, but they were very anti-clerical. And um, he, he had to leave France eventually and set off uh, just before the king was was murdered in the revolution, um, circuitously via Switzerland and then settles in England. So there are contacts uh, within esoteric Masonic circles, if you put it that way, um, that put him in and some quite high brow, high ranking people too at that. So he ends up living in Soho Square, which is the centre of the French community in London, mostly Huguenot, I might add, uh, but there is a Catholic church for sort of um, Irish and Italian migrants, very close to where Fournier was living, next door but one. So that was a new church at the time. It was built sometime in the 1790s um, when, when Fournier arrived. And he ends up living with Thomas Brand, uh, the second Lord Dacre. Uh, he was an MP and then member of the House of Lords, a barrister. Mm -hmm. And in 1814, he moves in with the diplomat, Sir Robert Adair. Now, Adair is a Francophile and a diplomat as well, and uh, very much involved in the sort of machinations behind the restoration of the monarchy um, on the fall of the Emperor Napoleon in 1815, uh, isn't it? 1815, the restoration. So that's the sort of background, and Fournier dies there, and he finishes his book, this, this treatise that you've mentioned. He's been working on it for 26 years, but he's had an eventful life. Um, it hasn't been an easy one, and uh, he eventually finishes it, writes it in French, gets it published by an expatriate French publisher on Soho Square, and um, and that's essentially it. Um, what we have is only the first part, I might add, of what was intended to be a two-volume treatise. So he's setting the scene in the first one, and right at the end, the autobiographical stuff comes in, the influences on his life, like Mesmer and Madame Guion and Pasquale particularly, they start getting mentioned. So you can imagine what the second volume would have been like. It was written, we know that, from notes on the book. Um, the copy that's um, um, held by the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, but it was never published. Mm. I know. Um, and he, he may have been concerned about the views of the church, and it probably would have moved on to more of what the Elo Cohen and Pasquale were up to, or perhaps even the mesmerism that he was involved in. He's quite a complicate, complex man, actually. Um, on one hand, he's very orthodox and very Catholic and loyal to the apostolic church. And on the other hand, he's, he's following Swedenborg and Madame Guion and the mystics and the quietists and, and also very much into mesmerism as well. Um, so, yeah, an interesting, interesting person for sure. Yeah, definitely. So th there's this uh, great antidote that that, that I, uh, uh, story that that you bring up in the book. Um, but but wh why did he consider the possibility when when he met Pasquale there on the street that 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 uh, that he might have been a devil, a devil in the flesh, and why might have that been a, a good thing for him, uh, because of where he was in his faith at that time, at this the point of this pivotal meeting. 
Okay, well, I've given some thought to that question, and um, I think the best thing to do is to let um, Fournier speak for himself. So I'll give you a, a quote from the, from, from the treaties with regard to that, because it's quite succinct and clear. And it also gives you an idea of where he's coming from, because he's a man of desire. He's on the quest, first and foremost, to know God um, through, through self-knowledge. And um, this is the great sort of undercurrent that underpins all of the great spiritual traditions, Catholic, Gnostic, non-Christian, Christian the like, you know, Sufism and so on and so forth. So um, I'll read that to you um, from, from, the, um, from the book, if I may. So where are we? Okay, there we are. So um, it pleased God to inspire in me an ardent desire that the future life was a reality and that all that I had heard about God, Jesus Christ, and his apostles were realities. About 18 months passed in all the turmoil these desires caused in me, and then God granted me the grace to meet a man who said familiarly to me, you should come see us, we are good people. You will open a book, you will look at the first leaf, the middle and the end of that book, reading only a few words, and you will come to know all that it contains. You see walking about you all sorts of people in the street. Well, these people do not know why they walk, but you, you will know it. This man, whose beginnings with me may seem extraordinary, was Don Martinez de Pasquale. As I first, uh, at first, I was struck by the idea that the man who had spoken to me was a sorcerer or even the devil himself. This first idea was quickly followed by another on which I stopped. If this man is the devil, I tell myself inwardly, then there is a real God. And it is to God alone that I want to go. And since I only desire to go to God, I will make as much of a journey towards God as the devil thinks he will make me do towards himself. So that I went to Monsieur de Pasquale and he admitted me to the number of those who followed him. So this is the Elu Cohen. Now he also goes on to say this. So those are quite profound and moving words, aren't they? Yeah. He goes on to say this. Pasquale's daily instructions were to carry us unceasingly towards God, to grow from virtue to virtue, and to work for the general good. They resembled exactly those which appear in the gospel which Jesus Christ gave to those who walked in his footsteps, without ever forcing anyone to believe them under pain of damnation, without imposing any commandments other than those of God, without imputing other sins and those which are expressly contrary to the law of God, and leaving us very often in suspense whether he was true or false, good or bad, an angel of light or demon. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I think even from uh, picking up, uh, hearing hearing that brief passage, so I, I found the, the book to be very beautiful uh, and, and beautifully written. Um, you know, that said, it, even in my personal opinion, it, repetitive is is maybe too harsh of a term right but uh it, it is kind of structured in a way where where we kind of come back to things a lot um but i, I understand that the, the book does have a bit of a reputation for being a bit of a slog um you know i i would actually say to people you know but when you buy your copy uh, uh you may want to read it a few pages at a time before bed or prayer but what what, what do you think about that and, and that reputation well that reputation largely stems from French readers um, and um, the criticism of, of Fournier is that his grammar isn't very good and it's repetitive uh, essentially and a lot of French Martinists complain that there's not a lot in there of any particular substance for them so these are the main sort of criticisms however it is a source document of early Martinism um, and he does have a great deal to say that is of, of significance and of, of great interest to us, actually. Now, um, he doesn't um, use chapters and he doesn't divide his book into, into subheadings and paragraphs or anything like that. And the reason is, you see, 
he's trained and he's emulating uh, in the style of St. Thomas Aquinas. So this is the monastic tradition that he's trained in, okay, which is to write very long treatises, if you're going to do one, okay, um, in a style which is didactic in its purpose and intended for meditation and reflection. So you're right about that. Um, the idea being that you would read um, parts of it, stop and start, where you're called to by the Spirit. And yes, it's repetitive, but that's the point of sort of, if you like, didactic reinforcement of the knowledge that he's imparting to you. So it's a monastic style of writing. He admits to having very few books. One of them is the um, In the Imitation of Christ by um Thomas Kempis, and so he he's he's replicating, he's attempting to replicate that style of writing and that manner of teaching through repetition and um, and and through that particular style. So yes, uh, you could call it a heavy read for sure, but it's a, a critical source document which we're lucky to have. It wasn't even published in French again until uh, I believe the nineteen eighties. It yeah, had so. simply gone missing in someone's collection. There's only two known copies. Yeah, and that makes me uh, that 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 makes me sad that the the second hand written edition, the uh, the sequel, will, will probably never be found. Maybe it is in some library or somebody's personal collection somewhere. But yeah. um, yeah, it's not. Be. It's like it's you, you know when we say treaties, like it, it's not a systematic book, right? It's not a it's not a, a clear laying out of a, a particular system. Say you know Pasquale's uh, uh, ideas about creation or uh, what how something that you should do, you know, in the step by step. But instead, it's, it's very poetic um, and uh, the, as you said, meditative and uh, does circle around. But uh, it circles around for 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 a reason, right? Um, um, so uh, the would you say that both he and, and actually Louis Claude de Saint Martin they they wanted to have their their books their work to have an impact on mainstream Catholicism and Christianity like they weren't writing for for an audience of initiatives or, uh, sorry initiates or esotericists like uh, they they wanted to get it out there and, and have an impact on the the religion of their of their time and going forward is that is that correct? Well, I don't suppose Fournier thought that many people would buy it. And that's probably why there was a limited run. Yeah. Um, but yes, he would have been quite happy for for uh, non-initiates, as you say, to pick up these books. And I also feel that's true of um, Pasquale's treaties as well, although it wasn't written for non-initiates. I think that there's a profound message in it. Sort of both of these books have moved beyond and past what they were originally written for. Yeah. For yeah. the audience they were written for. And that's like a lot of um, mystical and spiritual writings, actually. Um, but the book actually, I'll disagree with you on, on this. It, it is quite focused. Um, mm -hmm. The focus is on one message, which is essentially that it's um, in order to seek successful reintegration, uh, which is that process of, of sort of reacquiring our original form and, and being before before we sort of became incarcerated here as we are more, mere mortals suffering and everything else. Uh, the idea is that the, the only way to successfully achieve this is through the uh, practice of Christian ethics. Yeah. So that is the primary focus and thought feed of, of the treaty. So that's where he's coming from. And of course, it's only half of it. So we don't know where he was going to take this ultimately yeah. as well. So it is a little unfair perhaps for people to um, say, well, you know, it's sort of rambling on doesn't, really take us anywhere. Well, it, it, it does. It's setting sin about you do need the Christian ethics, Christian morality. And he's writing his day and time, of course. He wouldn't have been aware of many others. Um, just to say that this is this is what we need to follow. Now, um, you mentioned um, um, Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin. I mean, the, the approach of both men um, is is similar and different at the same time and they're both interested in reintegration of course and uh reacquiring our original knowledge of god and our relationship with him but fournier's approach is to christianize pasquale's message much more strongly than um saint martin wanted to do i mean saint martin left the order anyway yeah so um he wanted to sort of plow his own furrow and he sort of chose 
quietism. Bohemer and, and the like was always influenced by Pasquale because Pasquale's cosmogony makes sense and it's quite beautiful, his general doctrine, actually, in many ways. Um, but with um, Fournier, he remains very loyal to the church. He remains an ordained priest, tonsured one at that. Uh, and his, his life mission, if you like, what's motivating him to write both of these volumes and probably why he's living in comparative comfort, actually, with these um, sort of diplomatic families is because of his connections with high-ranking esoteric Freemasons who are still in France, who have somehow dodged the, the guillotine, uh, like um, saint Martin and Villemus. I don't know how they manage it. One can only imagine how that might have happened. So, okay. Um, so there he is. Um, so... You know, his approach is, is obviously to sort of reconcile Pasquale's teachings with Catholic dogma to some extent, although he does step outside of it. And you read between the lines and you can see, in fact, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, so that's essentially the sort of the, the difference between the two. And another reason, actually, why he probably didn't print the second volume um, was simply that he was probably aware as well that San Matan, one of San Matan's books ended up on the um, Index Liborum, okay? So it was prohibited by the, the Vatican. And he didn't want to do that. He was ordained. Um, so, yeah, uh, that, 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 that's the, the big difference between the two. But like all these things, they're sort of two sides of one coin trying to lead to the same conclusion ultimately, which is reintegration, the great Martinist uh, doctrine. Yeah. So, Michael, a, a, an easy question for you. Uh, what have we been? Who are we? And what will we become? OK, well, <laughs> it's a deep, that's <laughs> always the question. It's, it's probably the largest question ever asked of anyone ever. Yeah. Um, but turning to Fournier, um, what he might say, I mean, he's got some very interesting images that he wants to share with us anyway, which help answer that question. Because, of course, he titled the book that. And that's a typical sort of 18th century, very long sort of title. Shorter than most, actually. Shorter than Pasquale's title for his treatise. Um, so, you know, he talks at length about the prevarication of man, the fall of Adam and Eve. And he likens this with the two trees in the Garden of Eden, which is an interesting image to actually have in mind. Um, he talks about the... He focuses on the settling of, of the path of return. And he talks about this within the context of three distinct locations, okay, which is earth, purgatory, and heaven. Okay. Now, there is hell as a fourth, but he's not interested in that because his concept is everybody eventually will pass from heaven through purgatory into so earth through purgatory into heaven. But there will come a time. So another feature of his thinking um, as regards what we will become is that there is going to be a judgment day eventually. Now, like a lot of um, Martinists, he sees the earth and the universe as a sort of prison of space and time. So it's a quarantine part of the cosmos or creation, I should say. Um, so. As with Pasquale, he talks about the 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 um, origins of man before the Bible even starts talking about it. Fournier is sort of leading into that. He's 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 sort of talking, reading about that between the lines uh, in in that regard. So he sees the earth as as a place of of um, finitude, which is set in space in time, a place where we are through our own fault, incarcerated alongside our enemies, these prevaricating demons who fell from, from heaven in an, in an attempt to sort of rebel against God and become creators themselves. And so there is this core idea that we were once um, in glorified bodies, a bit like the Pauline um, sort of definition of it in the New Testament, um, we are now as we are in, in, in a physical form, which is aging and prone to suffering, death, violence, misery and all the rest of it. I don't want to get too Buddhist on you, John, but, you know, you get the idea. 
Yeah. Um, and then there is this future reintegration back to where we are. So it's circular in that in that regard. But in order to achieve it, you have to follow Christian ethics, the morality that sort of disciplines you um, or smooths the, the rough ashlar, if you like, in order to make that possible. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and to clarify, or if you can talk even more about that, like th this book is not a, a Catholic priest telling you, you know, not to lie because you're going to go to hell. Right. Because I think when some people hear Christian ethics, Christian priests, this this is what they're thinking. If this is a, a book on ethics and it is, as you said, you know, this this moral path leading to reconciliation, leading to reintegration. It, it's also not that we we want to live the ethical life so that God doesn't get angry at us, but that leading the ethical life puts us more into the spirit of God, moves us away from the prevacating uh, 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 spirits into uh, into a, another way of being, right? Uh, you know, yeah. I kind of hate the word vibration, but it gets... It gets the idea across, right? Living the, the ethical life, yeah. you know, gets gets our yeah. vibrations in order so that we yeah. can, you know, get up this path. Yeah. It's, it's, would, would you say all that is uh, is, is what four days sort of getting to? Entirely with that, and I think there's there's a, there's a there's a universal tradition underpinning that. Of course, it's one of the great teachings of Hinduism. I mean, vibration. Yeah, we need to move away from that word to find another one, but that's exactly what we're talking about: spirit being. Uh, essentially matter that vibrates on a higher level um which isn't sort of corruptible now yes i mean i take your point about um how um banging on about christian ethics and morality um is is quite off-putting for people i mean fournier himself repeatedly throughout the, the treaties outlines his frustration with people mocking him yeah. ridiculing his views um uh, he he rails against envy and pride and and the, you can sense his annoyance at their joy at his discomfort for his tonsure for example or perhaps even being a catholic in a protestant country like england or as a catholic priest in a post-revolutionary france um on the eve of the reign of terror so He's, he's aware that he's different in that regard. Um, and I, I think he would have a lot of sympathy with the view that, um, yeah, and in fact, he does criticise moralists. I mean, that's the thing. That's not what he's about. He's saying that this is how you can shape and fashion your life because it's actually through virtue that you can overcome the evil intellect and, and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. precisely. Um, that's our great challenge. And we all know we have a conscience, most of us, um, and uh, most human beings have a conscience, and there's a reason for it, you know. Um, and that's essentially um, what the treaties is telling us and where it's going. Exactly, exactly. So what would you say this book has to offer? And uh, two-part question. So, and, and of course, these these aren't necessarily uh, uh, distinct categories, but uh, contemporary Catholicism as a whole, would you say this book has anything to, to offer? And I'm talking more of the, the mainstream of the church, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Catholics who are on more of a mystical path. And then part two, uh, knowing that these are not necessarily distinct categories, you know, occultists and, and modern modernists in general. Well, you know, Catholics on a mystical path always have to keep their head below the parapet. Yeah. Okay. Um, the church tolerates mystics as long as they don't make a noise. Yeah. So for those out there that are mystical Christians and Catholics in the Western world, um, they can get some comfort from Fournier because he is – a man who remains die-hard loyal to the concept of the apostolic succession and authority of the church and its teachings, but is trying to reconcile Pasquale's doctrines with them. Yeah. And he emphasizes this repeatedly again and again. So in him, we can see that the, the Elu Cohen, and I'm talking about the original Elu Cohen of Martinez to Pasquale, um, was, was a, an order of Catholic mystics who were trying to sort of um, re reintegrate an idea of a, of a priesthood that is specifically um, 
aimed at exorcists combating evil and, and setting upon their own reintegration so that they can then in turn help society in general once they've sorted that out. So they're cleaning things up. Um, so there is a lot in there for Catholics if they're prepared to um, to to accept that actually there is a, a, a mystical um, leg or arm of the church which is secretly sort of existing alongside the exoteric um, side of it which isn't in competition with it at all it's not interested in the power and, and all that sort of stuff and it doesn't care about that as long as it's left alone to do this work alongside it not in competition with it and actually also relying in part upon the strength that comes from the exoteric church's own theurgy which is which of course is its sacraments yeah and there can't be anything more powerful for instance as an act of theurgy and sacrament than the doctrine of transubstantiation okay yep so you know um that that's fine so um catholic christians can can cheerfully um sort of pick up the treaties of matan of Martinez de Pasquale or Pierre Fournier um um provided of course that they they that I don't suppose they, they simply ring out any sort of loud bangs and whistles about it they'll probably end up getting booted out but it's always that but isn't it yeah yeah exactly um now with regard to Martinists well I mean it's pretty obvious really that um they should be interested in the core or foundational documents of their tradition. And you've got here one of the earliest Martinists and someone who was actually headhunted and picked out by its founder, Martinez de Pasquale. Now, yes, of course, you could argue, well, Martinism was Louis Claude de Saint Martin a bit further on, but that's all shaped and formed by his original master, whose cosmogony he always. Um, subscribe to anyway it was just the the methodology that changed but with Fournier we have a, an ordained Catholic priest remaining loyal to the church attending mass um, paying his dues in confession no doubt and everything else but uh, who was also practicing um, the the this um, mysterious um, tradition of the Elu Cohen um, harking back to the old Jerusalem temple and the exorcism that that involved, which we'll talk about in our in our following talk, of course. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, uh, we'll we'll wrap this up, and uh, people can can expect a treat. They can uh, expect a, a sequel. You know, in some ways, we've been following the path of reconciliation of reintegration because we've been working our way back uh, backwards all this time, right? Talking about uh, some other texts, talking about uh, uh, Martinez's. Uh, uh, um, uh, cos cosmology, cosmogony, his interpretation of the Bible, and uh, uh, we didn't start with the treatise, we're working our way back to it. So that is going to be our, our next show with Michael. Uh, it's going to be very exciting, and uh, we hope that you'll join us for that. But before then, a little bit of housekeeping, which is go to rosecirclebooks.com through that site, you can order your copy of What We Have Been we are and will become. So make sure you pick that up. Uh, as always, you can help so support the show financially by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic. They uh, allow you to do uh, reoccurring donations there for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. So, uh, Michael, again, a uh, real pleasure, and uh, I have a feeling we'll be seeing you uh, very, very soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.